All right, so what we're doing today is we're talking about a passage of the Bible. We're talking about uh, kind of uh, a lot of passages of the Bible covering one particular topic, and that topic is the word Sabbath. I'm going to go ahead and read you this passage. It's in Exodus chapter 20. It says this, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. There's an Old Testament principle called Sabbath, where God says, work six days, take a day off. Work six days, take a day off. Work six days, take a day off. That's this Old Testament principle. And I want to ask you a question right now, because I want to kind of get a feel for where we are in this room when it comes to our weekly work schedule. Please raise your hands and let me know visibly If there's anyone in the room who your regular work schedule includes five days per week of work, vast majority, would any of you in the room say that your regular work schedule includes six days per week of work? Would any of you say that your regular work schedule means you never sleep? (laughs) Okay, so I know this is going to be relevant to some of you, but for all of you, the majority of us work five days a week. It's the general American work style. Five days a week, two days off, usually on the weekends. I want to let you know, and hopefully I'll have enough time at the end of our gathering time to get into this, but I want to let you know that the reason we have a weekend, the reason we have two days of a weekend, is entirely in thanks to the Sabbath principle. And yet we take it for granted, and yet we don't live by it. And in fact, we think it's an archaic notion, and we think it's unnecessary. But did you notice that we just read from Exodus 20? Do any one of you know what Exodus 20 might be? Take Exodus, it's the second book of the Bible, you divide 20 by 2, you get a magic number, it's 10. And yes, it is the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 gives us the list of 10 commandments that God gives to us, and number 4 in the list is what we just read. Keep the Sabbath day holy, honor it. So see, some of us are in this mindset that, oh, we live in the New Testament times. Jesus died on the cross. He forgives us of all of our sins. He frees us from the Old Testament law. We don't have to abide by the Sabbath command anymore. Or or we say something like this, that whole Sabbath command was really an archaic notion. We don't have to abide by that Sabbath command anymore. We just need to, to keep working as much as we can, and we'll eventually make our way ahead because that's the way our world works. And yet, this shows up in the list of 10 alongside other things like don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. And if you happen to believe it's good for us to not murder, then you should also believe it's bad for us to not take the Sabbath. Now, here's the deal. We've grown to adopt a mindset that's true in our society that says, if you want to get ahead, you have to work hard. If you want success, you need to work hard. And then we translate the phrase work hard in our minds to be work longer. And then that's not good enough. We get really specific and we just simply say more hours. If I want to be successful, it means more hours. A guy named Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers. And in his book, his basic thesis is that to be great at anything, you need 10,000 hours. To be great at anything, you need 10,000 hours put into that practice of that particular thing. And that the elitist of the elite of this world are people who have gotten 10,000 hours into their field. And so we have begun to equate the number of hours we put into something with our success. And yet, maybe, just maybe, you like me have experienced that moment where it's a vacation day, a holiday, and you say to yourself, you know what, I really have got some things I need to do. And you put in the time to do that extra little bit of work. And at the end of the day, you don't feel any more fulfilled. You don't feel like you've accomplished that much more. You don't feel like you really gained any ground. Maybe it's because our success needs to come from something other than simply how many hours you stick on the clock. Maybe we should read another verse. In Joshua chapter 1, we find this. Be strong and very courageous, God speaks to Joshua. 
Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. Success comes from obedience. Let's keep reading. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. According to the way God designed this world to work, you do what God says and that leads to prosperity and that leads to success. And one of the things he said was, take a day off. So here's the reality. We have a tendency to believe if I just put in more time, I will get more success. I will gain more ground. And yet the truth is, there's some time that I need to take back away. I'm not going to put that time in anymore. I'm going to take it away. And that time is not anything I'm going to work in. Now, I want to challenge you with a couple things when it comes to the Sabbath command, okay? First, we're going to get some perspective. How important is the command? Then we're going to look at some uh, broader perspective of why does God give us the command in the first place? And then finally, I'm just going to tell you what to do, okay? That's how we're going to end. But start, let's start with some convictions. There are a couple passages in the Bible that really let us know how seriously God takes this. Numbers 15, 32 through 36 is one of them. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they kept him in custody because it was not clear what should be done to him. So what's happening here is here's this guy, he's gathering wood. Is gathering wood a bad thing? No. Gathering wood is a good thing. But he's doing it on the Sabbath. And so here Moses and Aaron, they're like, okay, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do about this because it's, he's clearly working on the wrong day, but he's not doing anything bad. He's just gathering wood for his family. What should we do about it? So they bring him to God, and here's what God says. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord commanded Moses. Whoa. I read that passage this last week, and I was like, oh my. Um, pick up logs on the Sabbath, get hit with rocks a couple hours later. Now, that just absolutely astonishes me. I look at that, and I think to me myself, I think to myself, that seems like overreacting. That seems like God is just getting a little overreactive, right? And you know why I think that and why we think that, that this seems like it's a little too harsh of a punishment for what he did? is because we think the Sabbath isn't that important already. It's because we think the Sabbath isn't important that death seems like too big of a punishment. Let me put it in context for you. Imagine, if you will, today is the day that SEAL Team 6 is getting ready to attack Osama bin Laden's compound. Okay? They're getting ready to go in there. They've got the intelligence. They know he's there. And then uh, the president has given the word, go and get him. So SEAL Team 6, they're getting ready to go. Well, one guy on the team decides that that's the perfect day for him to get his Christmas shopping done. And so he doesn't go on the raid. He stays back and travels to the nearest Walmart he can find in Baghdad or wherever. So he goes to Walmart. He does his Christmas shopping. What happens to him when he gets home? It's not going to be pretty. I'll just tell you that. I don't know what really will happen. Some people in this room might know what really would happen, but I know this much. That guy has done himself in. That guy, we're talking maybe the court martial, maybe you know, some type of a way without leave, maybe even death. I don't even know how all that situation works, but I know it's not going to be pretty. Why? Because even though shopping for your Christmas presents for your kids and friends and stuff is not a bad thing to do, if you do a good thing on the wrong day, it's a bad thing. If you do a good thing on the wrong day, it's a bad thing. And see, God looks at the Sabbath command and he goes, this is a day. In fact, let me share with you another passage. In chapter uh, 36 of Second Chronicles, it says this. Talking about Nebuchadnezzar, a guy that we've spoken about a few times before, he carried into exile... To Babylon, the remnant who escaped from the sword. 
and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Some of you were here during our series on Daniel. We spent a lot of time in Daniel talking about the 70 years that Babylon was going to be in power. Jeremiah had predicted it. And what happened was Nebuchadnezzar comes, he conquers Jerusalem, he takes all the people away, takes them to Babylon, and the land is left just absolutely with no one to farm it. Now what's interesting is that the Sabbath command God gave to people, work six and take a day off, he also gave to the land. He said that the people, when they're farming their land, they should work the land for six years and then give it the seventh year off. Don't sow any seed, just let it lay fallow. And so God made the command that the land was supposed to take a whole year off. And guess what? The people didn't do it. They didn't keep the Sabbath command when it related to their land. And so God says that one of the reasons they went to Babylon is to finally give the land a break to finally give the land its rest. This is amazing to me because it tells me that God was keeping track of the Sabbaths they didn't do. And he exacted them later like a debt being repaid. They didn't give the land its Sabbath rests, so God forcibly took it from them for 70 years to pay back this past Sabbath debt. Now, I'm going to tell you something that is not a clear biblical principle. There's no place in the Bible where I can say, here's what it says. But based on these two verses, I think it makes a lot of sense as a rule of thumb. And so I want to give it to you anyway and ask you to jot it down. Working on the Sabbath often backfires. Working on the Sabbath often backfires. You put in that extra time, you know, you know you're supposed to take this day off, you're supposed to spend it uh, worshiping God or something, you take that day and you actually work on that day, and yet somehow you're not as productive, and it actually backfires on you, because God has the ability to consider Sabbaths like a debt that he will ask you to pay back at some point in time. Now, that's, the, that's kind of the conviction I want you to have. The conviction is this, the Sabbath is really that important to God. Now, I want to give you some perspective. Why is the Sabbath that important to God? Let's look at a few more verses. Exodus chapter 16. Now, this comes before the Ten Commandments. It's the first time we get the word Sabbath um, when it comes to the nation of Israel, and it shows up before the Ten Commandments. Check it out. Moses is talking. He says to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever's left and keep it until morning. He's talking about the manna. What happened was every single Sunday, excuse me, every single day they would wake up and there would be this stuff on the ground, this food. They didn't know what it was called. They didn't know what it was. So they called it manna, which in Hebrew means, well, I don't know. And so they picked it up off the ground and they would eat it. They would cook it. They would mash it. They would make it into bread or something, or they would just eat it raw. And it tasted like honey cakes all by itself, mixed with coriander seed. So anyway, they would go out, they would find this manna, they would gather it. If they gathered too much, the very next day, it would have maggots in it. God said, I want you to trust me every single day. So don't take too much. You take too much, the next day it was all rotten, it was all maggoty, it was all nasty. But one day, I want you to take twice as much. Because the next day is a Sabbath day. Here it says, six days next. Um, oh, here it is. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. One more. Six days you're to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? On the Sabbath day, they went out, they looked for it, they tried to work, they tried to get just a little bit ahead, and it didn't work out. On the Sabbath day, they went out, they saw an opportunity. There's more opportunity there. Everybody else is in their house. We can gather more than normal, and there's nothing there. God says, I'm going to provide for you every single day. I want you to trust me. And I'm going to intentionally not provide for you on one day 
so that you can take a rest. So that you can rest. Let's keep going. Exodus 16. Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That's why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The operative word there is give. God says, I am giving you the Sabbath. When we make it to the New Testament, this concept is reaffirmed. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus says, Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Jesus says, right there, he, what he's just done is he's healed someone. And these people have come up to him and they're like, Jesus, come on, man, why are you, why are you doing this? You're healing people on the Sabbath. It's not right. You shouldn't be working on the Sabbath. And Jesus goes, what are you, nuts? What are you, nuts? This... The Sabbath was made for human beings, not the other way around. It's one thing for me to do work for myself. It's one thing for me to do work for my boss. It's another thing entirely for me to bless someone, for me to heal someone, for me to lift someone up, and for me to look them in the eye and say, you are forgiven and you are, you are okay with God. And Jesus says, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to keep doing it because the Sabbath was made for human beings. Here's the point. The Sabbath is a gift. God doesn't take the Sabbath from you. He doesn't say, one day out of the week, you got to give me your day back. No. Just like last week, we, we said that the tithe isn't something you give to God. The tithe is something God already gave to you for you to direct in a good place. Same thing with the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't something that you give back to God. Well, here's Sunday. I'm just going to give him my day again. And man, I wish I could do my work, but he's not going to let me. No, the Sabbath is a day God is giving to you. This is one day. No one can tell you what to do. That's the point. This is one day. God is just giving it to you as a gift. Let's keep going. There's a lot more to cover. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, this is the other place in the Bible where you find the Ten Commandments. One is in Exodus 20. The other one is in Deuteronomy 5. And so we read the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5 and find out a new reason for why the Sabbath is given. God says, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, here's the important thing. The reason they observe the Sabbath day, according to Deuteronomy 5, is because they used to be slaves and now they're not. See, slaves are the people who every single day of the week, they wake up to be more slave. Every single, seven days out of the week, a slave wakes up and he's still a slave. Seven days out of the week, a slave wakes up and he has to do what the master tells him to do. Seven days out of the week, nothing changes for a slave. But if you're not a slave, you don't have to do the seven-day thing. God says, I want you to take one day, shave it off, carve it off out of your week, and be free. Reaffirm your freedom. Here it is. Write this down. The Sabbath is for freedom. The Sabbath is for freedom. Exodus 20, verse 9 through 11. Let's go back to the Exodus version of the Ten Commandments, and we'll add verse 11 to it to find out what the reason is back then for the Sabbath command. Here it is. It's at the bottom. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And there's your next blank. The Sabbath is for holiness. Holiness. Now, we tend to think of the word holy as meaning something religious, like something is holy if it's spiritual, something is holy if it's pure, something is holy if it's, if it's righteous, something is holy if it's great and good and something. No, no, no. That's not the right way to think of holy. The word holy means simply this when the Hebrew people used it. It means only this, set apart, unique and different from everything else. When we say God is holy, we mean he is so totally different from everything else that you can't compare him to anything. When we say the Bible is a holy Bible, we mean it's a book that is so completely different from everything else, you can't really compare it to anything else. When we say the Sabbath is holy, we mean it's one day 
that is completely different from every other day. This is one way you know if, you've keep, if you're keeping the Sabbath. Do you have any 24-hour period in your week that is totally different from every other day of the week? That's what holy means. Set it apart. It's different. It's unique. It's special. The Sabbath is about holiness. Uh, last blank to fill in comes from Leviticus 23.3. It says this, there are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You're not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. And here in this verse, we get another new idea. And the new idea is that the Sabbath day is a day of sacred assembly and a day of sacred assembly to the Lord. In other words, worship is the operative word. The Sabbath is a day for worship, a day for God's people to gather together and a day for them to dedicate themselves to the Lord one more time. That's what it's all about. The Sabbath is for worship. Now, Psalm 92 also gives us an indication in what's going on here. I did a word search on Sabbath and Sabbath variations in the Bible, and there is one psalm where the word Sabbath shows up. It's in Psalm 92. And the word Sabbath shows up in the headline of the psalm. Some of the psalms have headlines. The guy who wrote the psalm put a header at the top to tell people why he wrote the psalm and what it's for. And Psalm 92 has that. And the heading says this, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. Now, all the psalms were used on the Sabbath by the ancient Israelites, but this psalm was specially for the Sabbath. This one psalm was an extra special Sabbath Psalm, the only one that de- identifies itself as a Sabbath psalm. And it says this, it's good to praise the Lord and make music to your name. Verse one, music. And then he says, O most high, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. And so what we get here is this idea that the Sabbath day is a day for us to get together with God's people and just to worship Him, to honor Him, to praise Him. And listen, music is not the only way to worship. And in fact, we do ourselves a disservice if we associate the word music and the word worship too closely together. But at the same time, music is the number one type of worship found in the Bible. Music is the number one category. When the Bible tells us to praise God and worship God, music is the thing that shows up in verse one. So why do we get together on Sundays and sing songs? Because that's an opportunity for us to worship God together. It's our Sabbath expression. Sabbath is really important to God. Sabbath is a gift of God to you. And now I want to give you what you need to do about it. So here's my push to help push you in the right direction when it comes to Sabbath. I'm going to give you two words. Here it is. To begin following the Sabbath, employ these two words toward God, rest and release. Rest and release. The word rest refers specifically to the fact that it's got to be a day where you do not feel the obligation to get one more thing done. If you spend your Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, you come to church, got that done with, now I get to go in the afternoon. Some of of the people come to the early gathering so they can have the whole rest of the day. You know, I've heard that phrase before. I come to the nine o'clock gathering because then I have the whole rest of the day to do whatever I want, sort of. Um, If you spend the rest of your Sunday with this idea, man, there's just, I just need to get this one more thing done. That's not Sabbath. That's not rest. That's just a different obligation from your slavery obligations the rest of the week. That's just a a new kind of obligation, obligation to the honey-do list or obligation to your own sense of guilt that your neighbor's yard looks better, your obligation to to, this is the only day of the week I really can shop with those deals because whatever, I don't care what the deal is. Rest means rest. Give it a rest. And then release says, as part of my Sabbath, I can let go of the one thing that plagues me, whether it's a work day or not, trying to please the people around me. I can release that. 
I can get a rest from that. My number one job all week long is to make the people around me happy. Got to make my boss happy. Got to make the kids happy. Got to make the relatives happy. Got to make the mother-in-law happy. Got to make everybody happy. Just got to hold down the fort, keep the peace, all that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? You've got a day during the week when you can take a vacation from that. Rest. Let them all think whatever they want to think. If you want to raise your hands, dance around this room a little bit during Sunday morning while we're singing some songs, just, you know, keep it under control. But go for it because, you know, I'm not going to judge you. I might look at you, but I won't judge you. Because, see, here's the deal. The way things need to work around this place, if we're doing our job right, then what happens here on Sunday is refreshing. If we're doing our job right, then what happens here on this sun, what happens in this place on Sunday is not obligation. It's not something where people come in and they're like, oh, I got I to gotta look right. I got to stand right. I got to raise my hands right. I got to sing the song right. I got to do the right thing. I got to put the right amount of money in the right plate when it, or basket or whatever it comes by. No, if we do our job well, Sunday morning should be a time where we say, wow, that's the best day out of my week because I can come and I can rest, and I can release. I want to jump to the end today, so we're going to have to skip the Isaiah passages again, Daniel. But I want to give you a couple suggestions to take it home for you. Three questions to help you ask to implement the Sabbath in your life. Number one, the first question is, what day is my Sabbath? What day is my Sabbath? Uh, traditionally speaking, if we go all the way to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew times, the Sabbath was Saturday. The last day of the week for them is the same as the last day of the week for us if we're numbering Sunday through Saturday. So Jews to this day, they still celebrate the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And so Saturday is their Sabbath. And there's in fact a church called the Seventh-day Adventists that to this day believe that the only day to celebrate the Sabbath is on Saturday. And the, and the Seventh-day Adventists, however, celebrate it. They celebrate it on Saturday, but they worship Jesus as opposed to just being Jews. And so, but anyway, so some people debate, is the Sabbath Saturday? Is that what it's all about? Well, I'll tell you what. Christians from the earliest days of the church realized that Jesus came to life on Sunday. And since Jesus came to life on Sunday, that is a world-changing event, almost as big, maybe as big as God saying he's going to rest on the seventh day. And so Christians decided they were going to honor Jesus on the day he rose, and so they started worshiping God on Sunday, which is the first day of the week. And you all have been taking all that principle for granted for your whole life because the Jewish people got you Saturday off, the Christian people got you Sunday off. And that's why we all work Monday to Friday, and except for some of you who have other weird kinds of jobs or whatever. So here's the situation. I don't honestly care which day you label your Sabbath, but get one. Get one. I think if you can, make it Sunday. Just line it down. And so now let me get real practical. Some of you work jobs where your boss will tell you, hey, I need you to work on Sunday. And I'm going to give you two options. All righty? Two options. Option number one, you say it's against my religious convictions to work on the Sabbath. It's against my religious convictions to work on Sunday. I'm sorry, I can't. And if he fires you because of your religious convictions, you've got a whole other story happening right there. Um, now, granted, some of you are afraid of doing that with your boss because you think your boss is the kind of guy who will skirt the law no matter what he, what he can do. And so I'm going to give you a second option, option number two, if you want to pull the cop-out option, the, you know, the, the brave option, just go up to your boss and say, sorry, this is against my religious convictions to work on Sunday, see what he does. I've said that in every one of the secular jobs I've ever held, and it's worked for me. So I don't even know if it'll work for you or not, but we'll, we'll just see. But here's your second option, it's kind of a cop-out, but still valid. It works like this. On Sunday... You choose a 24-hour Sabbath for that week. So Sunday comes, you wake up on Sunday, and you say, today's the day I have to work because of this, that, or the other thing, but I am going to identify a 24-hour Sabbath for myself before I hit the next Sunday. You pick it, you choose it, you stick with it, you stay with it, then you're one out of every seven. Sabbath, one out of every seven. Option, okay? Second question. What if I work on Sunday? 
well, my job requires me to work on Sunday because the second question is, what if I work in the church on Sunday? Is it wrong to serve in some capacity in a church environment on Sunday? Is that breaking the Sabbath? Well, actually, Jesus said something about that. He said that the priests in the temple, they work every single Sabbath day, and they're innocent of it. And so the bottom line is, if you are serving people and serving God in the faith establishment, then that's okay. Jesus says that's okay. So some of you had the excuse of Sunday's my Sabbath, I can't help out in Kidopolis. It's gone. <laughs> Jesus says that's okay. You can still Sabbath and work. According to Jesus, what I can do up here on Sunday is still kind of, it can be a Sabbath, you know? But let's get to the last question. The last question is, what if I find it hard to release? And this is the final question, especially right now as we're getting ready to enter back into a couple songs of worship, and as, as we were reminded this morning that the word soul for the Hebrews meant everything you are, not some spiritual thing inside of you, but it meant everything you are. So as we get back into that mindset, as we prepare our hearts for next week, I want to ask you this question. What if I can't release myself in worship? One final verse I want to look at. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. I want to challenge you with this thought. In every moment of worship, three things happen. Someone expresses themselves, someone observes, and someone feels indignant. In every moment of worship, you have three attitudes you can take. You can express yourself, you can stand by and watch it, or you can feel indignant about it. Those are your options. Now, according to Jesus, when he looks at this woman and he sees what she's done, he sees it as a treasured moment, but the people around him don't. Why this waste, they ask? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me, he says. Jesus looks at this woman. She is the person who's expressed herself. Jesus has watched it and loved it. And the people around are feeling indignant. But Jesus puts it all in perspective when he says, when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. See, Jesus says, guys, I'm dying next week. Do you know that? I've told you this time and time again. I came to Jerusalem so that I could die. They're going to kill me. And you don't get it. But this woman gets it. This is your chance to be with me before I die. This woman gets it. And she's not just giving me perfume all over my body as an act of worship thanks. She's giving me all this perfume as an act of worship preparation. She loves me so much that you didn't wash my feet when I came in here, but she poured this perfume all over me. She loves me so much, she's willing to spend a year's worth of income on a five-minute moment. He says, don't you get it? I'm dying. See, if you find it hard to express yourself in worship, bring yourself to this place where you recognize Jesus died for you. And though you don't have an opportunity to pour perfume on him to prepare him for burial, you can pour your heart out to thank him for his resurrection. What we do here this morning around this table is to celebrate that moment. It's an expression of worship that goes beyond music. It's an expression of worship that is a full release moment. When you put something in your mouth, you are fully releasing yourself to it. If you're allergic to shrimp and you put shrimp in your mouth, that's it for you, baby. You have fully committed and that's it. It's done. When you come to this table, 
and you take this piece of bread and you dip it in this juice and you eat it in remembrance of Jesus, you are fully committing to Jesus doing in you whatever he will do. That's worship. And that's saying, I'm going to express myself by releasing myself to you. Come into my life once again. Refresh me, renew me. On the night before Jesus was betrayed, it was a special Sabbath weekend. It was the, the Sabbath of Passover. When Jesus was in the tomb, it was a Sabbath day. He took the whole day off. He didn't rise from the dead until Sunday because he took Sabbath off. But going to the tomb, he sat with his buddies around the table and he took bread and he said, this bread is my body which is given for you. Take it in remembrance of me. And this cup is the new covenant made possible in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus gives this to us. We worship him with it. And we celebrate the Sabbath together today and every single week because he's given us such a great gift. I'm going to pray and then let me invite you to stay in your seats and reflect for a moment, jot some thoughts down on the card. And then as you're ready, as the music is playing, come down the center aisle, pass to one of these uh, communion tables, take a piece of bread, dip it in the grape juice, and then uh, Billy will be standing over there and I'll be standing over here. If you want someone to pray with you, we can pray with you. Just tap us on the shoulder. We'll pray with you. And then make your way on back. If you brought a financial gift, you can put it in the box in the back and praise God as you do so. But let's ask for him to make this a holy moment right now. Thank you for listening to this message from Lafayette Community Church. We believe that God has a full and fulfilling life in store for you. And we want to help you live it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, Pastor Jeff, through the web form at lafayettecommunitychurch.com. And as always, I encourage you to plug into a solid, God-honoring community wherever you may be. Life is a journey, and no one should ever walk alone.